reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. The angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of David his father, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have no relations with a man? And the angel said to her in reply, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible for God. Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The Gospel of the Lord. We begin our scripture today with King David peacefully at rest in his palace. Goliath is slain, all his enemies are conquered, all is well in the kingdom. The north and the south are enjoying a peace and a unity that they have not seen before. All is good, and the kingdom is unified. His plans have come together quite nicely, and yet he also knows all his success is because of God. The surprise of a shepherd boy becoming a conquering king is indeed amazing, and he knows where it all comes from. And so, in interest of his legacy and to do something to glorify God, he says to himself, Here I am living in a cedar house while the ark of God dwells in a tent. I will build a temple. In spite of all his success and God basically giving him everything he wants, this noble legacy is something that God says to him, no, you're not doing that. Wow, what a surprise. He's been dreaming about this. God says, no, you need to leave that dream alone. So David obeys and he abandons his dream. Boy, was David going to be in for a surprise. Because of this obedience to God, the temple he wanted to build was now becoming something much bigger. A plan that God had crafted from the foundation of the world that he might have a universal temple but not made of stones but made of living stones of a people who could come together in worship. 
Not necessarily a place to worship, but a people who worship, with whom he is delighted to be unified. A universal temple, building blocks made of a people who love and adore God. David, in a surprise, was to become open to the surprise of Christmas. Mary receives a revelation also, and she too is called to abandon her dreams. She obeys God and does exactly that, and boy was she in for a surprise. There's something that St. Paul refers to in Romans chapter 16 that comes up today, which is exactly what Mary and David did. St. Paul calls this the obedience of faith. It's when God asks something of us and we do it because we trust him. Even if it means abandoning our dream, because when we do that, we become open to the surprise of Christmas, the dream of God himself. Obedience of faith, I was thinking of analogies for this. It's a, li it's a little bit short, but I think it works for our purposes. The obedience of faith is kind of like the stock market. Everybody raised their head, isn't that interesting? Now that I've got your attention. If I have blind faith, I'm going to see some stock that I, of a company that catches my attention and I like it, so I'll invest in that. That's blind faith. The obedience of faith is when there's research done and I realize that I can't discern this stuff on my own, so I go see an expert and I consult him or her, and based on their track record, in investments, I listen to what they have to say, and I follow it. And then, 10 years from now, a big surprise. The obedience of faith is where we, based on God's track record, put our trust in him. We invest in heavenly treasure and are prepared for a big surprise. And we do it because we trust him, even though obeying him defies some of our dreams and our preferences. What about my dream? Where is that considered? A few years ago, I had dealings with someone who was um, an alcoholic, and he was um, very well placed in the AA community, and he was a sponsor for many, many people. He was considered like a guru of his area. And one of the lines that he would throw out at people who he was sponsoring when they didn't want to get rid of the things that led them back to drinking, he'd say, how's that working for you? Your life is in the toilet. How's that working for you? And I had the opportunity to talk to him about some of his own priorities in his faith. And I threw the line at him that he most used because he needed to hear it. I said to him, how's that working for you? Your dream is sabotaging not only your sobriety, but your eternity. How's that working for you? I was thinking this weekend, yet last night at the 4 o'clock Mass, um, Mandy and Charlie were celebrating their 50th anniversary. I can't understand why Charlie's hair is all gray since the marriage and her hair is still blonde. She must have the better deal, it's obvious. Okay. But 50 years of marriage, they had to set aside a lot of dreams. And this is one of the things that makes marriage a sacrament. It has the possibilities of 
revealing to us the truths of the kingdom. My dreams and preferences are sacrificed for the sake of the beloved, and there is our relationship with God. However, my willfulness can prevent me from receiving the wonderful surprise of Christmas. You see, every day should be a Christmas because every day I set aside my willfulness for the will of God, the obedience of faith. Jesus gives me his heart and I give him mine. And there is God's dream to pour out his heart for us in a manger that we will celebrate later this evening and tomorrow. Because God's dream, God's plan for us is that the word would become flesh and pitch his tent among us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish but might have eternal life. That's God's dream. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. For all who are willing to place the limits of their own dreams in the hands of God, whose dream is eternal for us. Tomorrow is Christmas, and your dream will be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Regina Jenny, let her rest.